Hello, hello everyone. It is I, to Athamar7, about to begin a replay of A Sky Full of Stars. I have actually played through this once before, but um, having enjoyed it once some time ago, I wanted to uh, start it over and this time record what I did, record, uh, uh, read it for you for the most part, uh, and uh, enjoy it. Enjoy the game. Hopefully you will enjoy the game along with me. So let's go ahead and get started. Game Maru! Yeah, uh, this is Akito. Akito? Soto, mite, soto! Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I opened the foggy window, and when the cold breeze blew in and touched my face, it sent a chill down my spine. When I saw the stars twinkling outside, I snapped wide awake. Yeah. Well, Hikari and I and Matane. I rushed off, pedaling my bike with all my strength. I found Hikari waiting for me at the usual bridge. She was running around in circles like a dog chasing its own tail. As she yelled, her breath came out from clouds of white. Where's Saya? If we don't hurry, the sun will come up on us. I got worried and looked at the eastern sky, but it was still so dark. I would I never would have known it was almost dawn if she hadn't said so. Hop on. stuff in the basket and Saya climbed onto the cargo rack. Then Akari climbed on as well, holding on behind holding on to Saya from behind. Uh, Akari squeezed Saya even closer to me, even though she was already pressing into my back. I, I put my feet on the pedals and guided my bike across the bridge on the dark mountain from behind. We suddenly picked up speed and went flying through the wind. The wind was so frigid on our faces it was more than cold, it was painful. Saya, press your face into my back. With the weight of three people, the bike was too heavy to keep climbing the hill on its rough with its rough broken asphalt. As the slope got steeper, I lost more and more power. H Hikari, help me out! As we slowed down, Hikari jumped off the back, grabbed the cargo rack, and started pushing. Saya, hold on tight!
With a burst of added speed, our bike left the mountain road and passed through an overgrown meadow, heading into the middle of the forest. When the trail finally became too much for the bike, we threw it aside and set out on foot. And soon the forest gave way to... A large black silhouette resting quietly in the dark as if it were a sleeping beast. It was a train car. Uh, we were at a train station clinging to the mountain slope. It felt deserted, but not only because it was early. No one used this station anymore. It was totally abandoned. Hikari climbed up onto the roof of the decommissioned trains, the car standing at the platform. <laughs> Saya finally made a doubt of the forest trail and approached the platform. Come on, take my hand. I gave Saya a hand, and since she couldn't climb up on her own, I'm watching a step. Hikari grabbed Saya's hand from above, as she lost her footing almost immediately. With our help, Saya finally climbed onto the roof, and I followed after. What do you think, Hikari? While she waited for me to climb up, Hikari scanned the horizon. From up here, our field of view was wide open way to the distant sea. However, to the naked eye, the sky was still as dark as midnight. It was hard to make out the sea from the sky. Even so, the sky was clear and countless. Tiny points of light twinkled above. Hikari was searching for the morning star among them. Which one? In the eastern sky, just above the horizon, the crescent moon drew its slender arc. Just next to it, shining with the light unmatched, even by the sky's only fixed star, Sirius, was a single bright light. We spread out our equipment and quickly got started re getting ready. Don't rush us! set up the tripod and the stand. Next, with practice hands, we assembled the telescope. It wasn't difficult when we finished. I pointed the telescope at the star we had just looked at and looked through the finder scope. I centered it on the shining, heavily object. Then I looked through the eyepiece. However, I didn't see the object in my field of vision. It was because the finder scope's optical axis hasn't been aligned. I would just have to rely on my own senses to hone in on the heavenly body. It's waning. There it is, Venus. Hold on. I changed out the lens to increase the magnification and adjust the focus. The blurry figure of Venus leapt into clarity. That's definitely Venus, and it's waning. It's so bright. Oh, hush. Here you go. After we took turns looking through the telescope, I opened our notebook and handed it to Saya. While Hikari held the flashlight for her, Saya drew a sketch of Venus. 
in star observation, you don't just stop after viewing an, an object once. You have to note how the object moves, how it looks, how it changes or it doesn't change. You keep records over days, over weeks. This book was our planetary observation journal. You would never know without looking through a telescope that Venus waxed and waned just like the moon. Its apparent size could change sixfold. Each location in the sky also changes, so there were times where you couldn't see it at all. We kept the record for ages, but lately we haven't been able to see the planets due to raining clouds. It's been two weeks since our last entry. Very soon Venus would begin rising later and later, and it would be difficult to see. So that's why we had to hurry today. The forecast for this morning had been overcast again, so I had given up, setting my alarm for the usual time and went to bed. But for whatever reason, Hikari ignored the forecast and woke up early. We owed her big time. Looking through the telescope, Venus was so bright, it was almost blinding. And it was waning, just like the moon. Saya drew the shape carefully. As she did, the sky gradually began to lighten. It was dawn. It was six in the morning, the coldest part of the day. It was cold, even the slightest breeze felt like it was freezing you. The three of us huddled together to fight the cold. And I brought some bread for breakfast. We shared our food and looked over our observation notes. There were entries showing Venus in full, as well as its waning, with the dates entered. Later, we'd color in today's entry and write down anything we observed. Today's entry with Venus in the rendezvous with the crescent moon uh, was a wonderful addition to our observations. When you take the time to observe, you can take notice of the wonders around you. And there are also puzzles to solve. Mercury and Venus wax and wane like the moon. That's because these two planets orbit closer to the sun than the Earth does. Changes in the way the sun's light shines on them make it look like they are waxing and waning. They are always near the sun, rising at dawn and setting at dusk. Uh, that's why you can't see those two planets in the middle of the night. Even as the deep indigo of the winter sky began to lighten, Venus still shone brightly. That's why it's called the morning star. It announces the dawn. Shining serenely in the morning sky as it does, even without a telescope, it was beautiful. Yet as brilliantly as it shines, when the sun comes up, it would surely fade into the greater light, like all of the other stars. Our observation journal was almost done. On other pages, we had sketches of Mars, Jupiter, and the moons, uh, uh, and Saturn's rings. We'd even written about the other planets, the ones that look like tiny dots even in this telescope, uh, that we researched in the library. Just a little more work and our grand project would be finished. It was a little premature, but a huge feeling of accomplishment grew within me, and soon I felt the warm enough to, go for, to forget the cold. Saya clapped her hands happily. I stared up awestruck at Hikari's face illuminated in the dawn, dim light of dawn and felt a sense of hope. Right. I felt we could go anywhere. We could solve the mysteries about our space. 
I felt like we could reach out our hands and catch the stars. The three of us. As long as Akari is here. I turned off my alarm and lay there for a while. Then I crawled out of my sleeping bag and poked my face out of the tent to have a look around. The sky was shifting from black to deep blue. The stars were almost nowhere to be seen, and dawn was coming soon. Looks like I overfest slept a bit. The chilled air forced me awake as I boiled water on my portable gas stove. I mixed the water with the dark brown powder in my cup. Oof. The sky, free of dirt and smog, was clearer at dawn than dusk. As the sun climbed over the horizon into the pure clear sky, the colors grew in a beautiful graduation. Gradation. As always, it was a sight that made my heart feel washed clean. From my seat on the mountain peak, I had that sight all to myself while I drank the instant coffee. I will never stop loving this. I enjoyed the blissful moment as I warmed up my numbed fingers from the ste on the steaming cup. My heart dried out and twisted from the constant rat race of daily life and studying, felt steeped in warmth and washed clean. The only coffee on the mountain top was instant. It didn't need any richness or deep flavor. The mountain provided that. Incidentally, I called this a mountain peak, but getting here didn't call for anything as grand as mountain climbing. It's the kind of place middle-aged folks in light clothes hike to on a weekend afternoon. You can ride a bike right up here. Even so, I was all on my own. I had the scenery and cool air all to myself. For just this moment, I could forget my daily life and all the little irritations of school and enjoy the solitude. It was the greatest, most luxurious moment of bliss. But it seems like a bit of a waste to enjoy this all alone. Even though no one was there to hear the words trumbled out like an apology, and I picked up my smartphone. The thin plate of glass was like a symbol of daily life and my relationships with the people on this planet. I should stare, should share this feeling with someone. The first face that popped into my mind was Takichi's, my best friend, uh, but I shook my head and drove him out of my mind. He's no good. He doesn't have an ounce of sensitivity. This would be wasted on him. It would just encourage his vanity. I tapped my chat app and selected Sai's name. The pre-dawn sky. I sent her a short text along with a picture. Saya was so delicate and full of sensitivity, would surely understand the depth of my emotion. 
she's not answering. My text sat there, displaying the word unread. But that was a given. It wasn't even six in the morning. She was probably still asleep. Even though I knew why, it bothered me that she didn't answer. I should have sent that. I shouldn't have sent that message. I guess I'll go home. I finished my coffee, completely cold now, and stood up feeling dejected. If I could have, I would have stayed and prayed to the morning sun, but I had to get to my part-time job. I pulled myself together and started talking down my taking down my tent. Arigato gozaimasu. Customers always start trickling into Satome, Sayatomes, Sayatomes. Let's try that right. Sayatomes stop and buy almost as soon as it opens. Unlike more famous convenience store chains, it has a rural feel to it. Also, it was the right right in front of the station, so it was actually pretty convenient. Having said that, though, it was a tiny countryside station. Most morning customers were students, adults on the way back to on the way to work, or old timers stopping by to buy breakfast during their morning walk. Always the same faces. That's 142 yen and change. Thanks for stopping by. When the customers lit up, I had a chance to take a breath, and then I suddenly heard the excited voice of a barking dog coming from outside. Oh, she came. I went out to look and was met with the same old scene. That is, a Sheba standing on its hind legs, wagging its tail and straining its le lead to the limit. And in front of him, her brow furrowed in deep consternation, stood a girl in her school uniform. It was an odd scene, but taken as a picture, it was actually quite pleasant. The girl had the kind of beauty you'd usually see in commercials. Her face was perfectly laid out, her figure was slim and elegant, and her hair shone under the morning sun all of which made her the arch archetype of the beautiful schoolgirl. Of course, what was most striking about her was something else. It was her eyes. Her left eye and right eye were different colors. One was an intense blue and the other orange tinged with amber. Those beautiful jewel-like multicolored eyes were now tearing up. At first glance, it seemed like the girl was crying because she was surprised at the Sheba's excitement, but actually, it was something else. The girl seemed to reach out her hand, then retracted it, but then reached out again. The dog, seeing this, sensed something was about to happen and got more excited, whipping his tail back and forth and barking happily. She couldn't bear it anymore. The girl with multicolored eyes reached out to pet the Sheba's head. Stop, Saya! <laughs> Her hand stopped just in time. You know how this ends, right? What will happen if you play with him? <laughs> That's what you said last time, but you couldn't help it when it ended up. Who ended up crying then? It was shedding season, and the Sheba's fur was in the middle of regrowing, <laughs> and was shedding a ton. To clean her fur-covered uniform last time, she had to buy a lint roller from us and really work on it. Kutaru and Sheba reached out his nose and carefully sniffed at the girl's outstretched hand. Saya just stared at Kutaru with his, her teary, jewel-like eyes. Tup, tup, tup. Close to tears, Saya waved regretfully at Kotaru and rushed into the store. It had all the drama of a scene in some old movie where a mother had to give up her own child because the family is too poor, but then... What the... Yeah! 
she tripped and did the perfect headfirst slide into the carpet in front of the shop. And then a shadow appeared over her. <laughs> Kotaru, having finally succeeded in breaking the clip on his leash, leapt onto Saya with joyful energy. <laughs> Kotaru, quit it out! <laughs> okay, raise your arms. Kotaru had his way with Saya until I dragged him off with his leash. And thanks to him, I was now cleaning Saya's fur colored, uni colored uniform with a lint roller. Leaving it here last time had been the right decision. Uh, this is partly your fault, you know, getting him worked up like that. Kotaru was usually really shy and timid, but if someone he liked came along, he'd wag his tail and want to play. Especially when it was Saya, who he'd loved more than his master for ages. Whatever the case, he was clever, easy to train dog, who was usually well behaved. If Saya hadn't done her little, I'm going to pet you, no wait, I'm not, okay, I will, tease, he never would have gone off like that. Uh, did you skin your knees? She's lucky she didn't get hurt. Uh, there's some on your butt, too. Hi. She blushed and took the roller, then twisted around to get the fur off of her backside. Uh, just then, the store manager came out front. Sure thing. My part-time job is only in the morning, from opening up the store until the manager is finished with breakfast. In the back of the store, I took off my apron and changed into my uniform. Saya blushed again and hurried off to get something for lunch. Saying this, she slipped a steamed port bung in the bun into Saya's shopping bag. Feeling a little jealous, I got something for lunch too, and we left together. Alright then, see you later. When we left the store, Saya handed me half of the pork bun she'd just gotten. She even gave me the bigger half. Saya, so, you are way too nice. Stop and buy pork buns are a little different from other places. They're handmade by the manager's husband and packed with a delicious filling. They're also huge. Uh, they are even bigger than other chains' pork buns. The buy buns are kind of famous around here. <laughs> Munching on the steaming pork bun, I took out my phone. And what do you know, Saya had answered. Knowing that improved my mood, so I closed my eyes and slowly started talking. The mountain is so nice, you can feel the wonder of nature with your whole body, and it makes you feel so small. Behind my eyelids, the deep solemnity of the morning's view returned to life. And in the middle of that view, drinking a single cup of instant coffee and is the ultimate luxury. I tried to tell her, but Saya's reaction was so strange. She filled with self so filled with self-satisfaction that I figured I should hurry up and read her reply. Ferrari 
for real? Arigato Saya! Saya's family, Odin. Uh, the grandeur of nature around the mountain peak with coffee was no rival for this luxury. It was something to look forward to. When she saw the bus coming, Saya rushed to finish her pork bun. You better slow down, you'll burn yourself. Hi. Later. Bye bye. She got on the bus and said hi to her other students from the school from her school, then waved to me from the window. One of her friends, seeing this, leered and poked her in the side, and she blushed and shook her head quickly. She probably got upset because they mistook her for her me for her boyfriend again. No matter how often it happened, she always overreacted like this, like it was some, like it was for the first time. Uh, that's Saya Amanagawa in a nutshell. Uh, when the bus was out of sight, I unlocked my bike. Guess I'd better go too. Oh, hi, Ogazimas. Uh, I was sort of camping in the mountains. I greeted my teacher and headed through the school gates. I parked my bike and went toward the buildings, but I didn't head for my home room. Uh, building 2, where the culture club's are, rooms are located, was deserted as it was still pretty early. I walked down the hall quietly and stopped in front of a certain door. Astronomy Club. Uh, that was what was written on the sign of that door. I took a key out of my pocket and opened the Astronomy Club room door. I feel like I could sleep through the first period. Truly feeling tired, I dropped the bag that was weighing down my shoulder and looked at the clock. I had ten minutes until homeroom. I had planned on mixing in the, with the sports team to get in on their post-morning training shower, but there wasn't time. I guess I'll just wash my face and brush my teeth, then head to class. I grabbed the towel and toothbrush from my desk and headed out of the room. A totally no more normal morning. The beginning of another day, nothing special about it. I didn't think much about it, but figured this was likely how all my days would be. But on that day, after school, something would happen that would bring a little variety to my daily life. This must be the place. The Private Institute, Maiku Academy. It's an escalator school going from kindergarten all the way to college, located near the sea in the sprawling city of Hoshinanaka. Getting better at that. <laughs> Just by looking at it, you could tell it was a school for the kids of the well-to-do families. Uh, watching the kids going home, you got the feeling that they were somehow more refined. And while they lived in the same city as us, they were really in a different world. I gathered my resolve and went against the flow of students going home, entering the school building. Inside, the building seemed even more otherworldly than the exterior did. What is this place? Is this actually a school? I was in an airy corridor lined by glass walls. It felt like I was lost in some palace in a faraway land. Even under normal circumstances, visiting another school was nerve-wracking, but this feeling of strangeness was something else. Of course, all the students I passed stared intently. I went down the hall, trying hard to avoid any eye contact. I guess this is it. I stopped in front of the door and looked at the sign marking my destination. Astronomy Club. 
It was written right in front of me. Gulping nervously, I knocked on the door. Excuse me. To my surprise, the door opened and revealed only darkness. No one's here? At least, that's what I thought until a tiny light popped into life in the middle of the room. What? A girl's face appeared in the faint light, and I nearly let out an involuntary yelp. In the light, flickering red like a candle, the young woman reached out for one of the cards laid out on the table. They looked like tarot cards. She looked down at the card and spoke. It was as if she was reading the future, uh, like some kind of fortune teller. I answered, Uh, yeah, I was told to come here at this time. I couldn't tell if she'd heard me or not, but the beautiful yet creepy girl put the card back on the table and let out a little laugh. Uh, hi, I am. Um, wait, hold on. What's Maya? Huh? I thought it was a rather vague answer. I wanted to go home. Uh, what was with this totally creepy girl? Uh, what was the room so dark for? Uh, wasn't it in the astronomy club room? Why was she doing tarot or whatever? And who is Maya anyway? <laughs> Looking at these buildings from the outside, I had thought the people here existed in another world, but now I felt a thousand times more out of place. Uh, I just stood there, not knowing how I should respond. Ev eventually, Miss Beautiful, but totally creepy, broke the silence. What exactly was the standard response at a time like that? That's not really something you teach. They teach you in school. I trusted my instincts and answered, Oh man, I think I love my stove on. That could cause a fire. I have to hurry back. Matinee! Just before I could leave, the door behind me slammed shut, closing me in. The darkness grew deeper than before, and sweat started to run down my forehead. I suddenly felt like I was about to become part of some ridiculous crime scene, and I had really been looking forward to going home and having Saya's Odin to enjoy that flavorful, tender, stewed radish, that fish cake so juicy and soft. And though they may call me a heretic, the inescapably captivating cabbage roll. Uh, I, I don't have the kind of training necessary to stay calm in a situation like this. Could you at least open the curtains? If not, I am going home even if I have to force my way out. With the heavy curtains opened, the windows allowed soft sunlight to fill the room. What had up until now been a creepy chamber was real to be a standard astronomy club room. It was perfectly normal room all along. <laughs> this was turning into a chore. But at the same time, when, the, when she was stumbling around in shock like that, it oddly made her more beautiful. So, 
you are. Make all that in demon, the Zen Pucho, Shiratori Horihimeno, Hajimena Ste, Saramik Kaicho no Hosa Ken, Gen Pucho, Stomas Sate, Tadai Torimas, Yoshioka. I had heard about these two from our president, or rather, our former president. Oderheimi was a third year, and Honoka was a first year, like me. As a third year, Oderheimi should normally have been retired from the club life, but maybe at a school like Maiku, third years are less worried about tests. It's nice to meet you both. I'm Ikito Sodoremi. Um, I'm a first year in the astronomy club at Hoshino Daishi. Arigato when I sat down, they brought me an elegantly decorated cup of tea and a wild strawberry tart. I didn't really think that was the proper way to meet someone for the first time myself. If I had been Saya, I'd be crying. Anyway, what did you want to talk about? I felt like she had something about it, said something about it before, but. It had been so wrapped up in fancy language I hadn't gotten it. No, not really. A look of shock covered Orohime's face. Our president didn't tell me anything at all. The only reason I came was because the president asked me to. It's complicated, but by president, I actually mean former president. He's a third year. He had to retire from the astronomy club last summer. Uh, since I was the only member of our astronomy club, I also became the president, despite being a first year. But as there wasn't weren't any other members, there wasn't anyone to call me Mr. President. And although I should have been aware of my own position, I always called the former president president, and for me, uh, he was still the president. It's a little complicated. The president told me, I want you to go and hear what Onohaimi at Maiku Academy has to say, but nothing else other than that. Honoka was whispering into Oraheimi's ear. The two of them stared at me curiously. Uh, what was that look for? Those two were the weird ones. I was just here out of respect for my president. The Six Stars Club? No, not really. I'd never heard of it. It kind of sounded like the name of a kid's playgroup. An association from six schools around what is now Hoshinonaka City, formerly uh, Hoshino City and Amananoko City. Six years ago, a disagreement over the direction it was taking resulted in its dissolution. Sounds like uh, most rock bands break up. But anyway, I had no idea there had even been such a group. What a romantic story. Okay, uh, so what about this group? Hmm? Monica came up close to me. If we continue on this path, we are doomed. You must awaken from your ageless slumber, Maya, eldest of the seven sisters, to deny our fate. I think that was what she had said to me, but I still didn't get it. It's just me. Orohaimi had a smug look on her face. 
天の中西4名諸見沢工業3名そして我が名工学院は私を除いて3名さすがマイヤの空見焼きと察しがいいわ Okay, so what is it with this Maya stuff already? Mutsiabush no Zenseki, Kako no Buinsu, a Hakin Jume Zengo. Motomo Katsuga Sakandata, Amano Nakanishiva, Saiko Buinsu, Sanju Rokme. Sorega, Imaya Dono Gako, Mo, Hibusun Zen no Kyojo de Dine Niva, Sarana Buinsu, Genshu Mo Yoso Saremas. When she heard Hanako's words, Orohami sighed and looked miserable. Marude, Hitono Itonami ga umidasta machino akariga, Yozora no hosio, Hitots, Mata Hitots to Kakikiste Shimao Yoni. Marevarewa, Yuruyakani, Horobi no Michio Tadotti. So Kuni Taisho Sur Hitio Garuwa, Hosino Nakara, Temon no Tomoshibi o Kesana Itamino, Katsten Ogon Jida, you Torimodos Hitio Garuno. To prevent the guiding light of the astronomy from dying throughout Hoshinanaki City, we must bring back that golden age. Rebuild the Six Stars Club. Orohaimi nodded her head with a very serious look on her face. It wasn't unusual for astronomy clubs from different schools to work together and have observation meetups. It's like when sports clubs have scrimmages with teams from the other schools. The Six Stars Club started out as just an observation meetup. It later morphed into a more permanent arrangement with activities outside of their respective schools. After the fall of the Six Stars Club, each school club lost a lot of its members. So in order to revive the Six Stars Club as a whole, each individual club would need to be revitalized as well. But the Six Stars Club was shut down by alumni, wasn't it? Uh, what exactly happened in that disagreement over its direction, I wondered. If we just go out and try to rebuild it, won't they get mad? At some schools, former members of the sports club sections held a lot of clout over them, even though, although astronomy felt under culture, fell under culture club rules. Uh, whether they allowed it or not, if we tried to revive the Six Stars Club, they wouldn't hesitate to butt in. With a supremely competent smile, Orohaimi walked to the middle of the room and stood in front of the spherical astrolabe set conspicuously on the table. It was quite old-looking, judging from the centered placement of the Earth and the surrounding celestial bodies. It appeared to be a decoration modeled on something from the Ptolemic Emmer. Orohaimi placed her hand on it. <laughs> Saying this, she slowly spun the astrolabe. The planets orbit around me. And what seemed to be she seemed to be saying With these hands I can alter the course of the planets themselves. Although I have to admit I wasn't exactly sure what she was going for. They actually practiced for this? For the time being, I pretended not to notice Orohaimi's dedication to the performance and said, I see what you're saying and I understand your motivation. Yeah. But I don't think I can help you. I don't even do stargazing anymore. I'm still a member of the Astronomy Club, but it just sort of worked out that way. I've already started, decided not to look at the sky anymore. I tried to sound apologetic, but Orohaimi just stared at me with a confused look on her face. Which was expected. If someone in the astronomy club had told me they didn't look at the stars, I'd do the same. Well, if you already know, then there's no need for me to explain it again, so... I guess if that's all, I'd better be going. And with that, I stood up and started to leave. Mate. Oral Jaime suddenly grabbed my hand. 
It was softer than I could have imagined, uh, and I froze in place. Orohime stared into my eyes. She stared unmoving into my eyes as if she was reaching into my deepest memories. I'm, I'm sorry, really, but, but I can't. Or Jaime wilted, her disappointment visible. It was like seeing Kotaru get mad when get sad when Saya wouldn't play with him, and I couldn't help but feel guilty. Well, uh, I have to get to work. Unable to bear it any longer, I stood to go home, but this time it was Hanukkah who stopped me. Fine. <laughs> When I said that, Orohime seemed to cheer up a bit. She even smiled a little. That smile was more pervasive, persuasive than any ridiculous argument, and I found myself nodding subconsciously. Oh, Bye-bye! The girl on her way home was from Hoshino Daiichi, waved, so I gave her a little wave back. I had no idea. I'd come by so many times that I guess they remembered me now. That's what they seem to be calling me. My face felt hot. They were saying something about a boyfriend, too. I did worry a little. Just like the ones before, all students on their way home looked my way. I guess it was only natural since it was so rare for a girl wearing another school's uniform to be there. But I got so embarrassed that I couldn't stand it anymore. Feeling helpless, I looked down at the package in my hands. If she'd been smiling like that from the start, I never could have refused. I muttered, thinking back on Orohime's grinning face. The first impression was so creepy, but I guess I was lucky I couldn't really pay attention to the rest of her. Uh, she's a little older, so she's got a different kind of beauty compared to Saya. Uh, her boobs are bigger, too. <laughs> Saya wouldn't be very happy if she knew I was using her as the basis of comparison, but <laughs> I thought to myself as I pedaled my bike through the school gate. Whenever I thought of Saya, I thought of Odin. Oh, Saya's Odin. I sighed like a lovesick child. It was just about time for work. My trip to Maiku Academy took longer than planned, so I didn't have time to go by Saya's house to pick up my Odin. And I had really been looking forward to tonight's banquet. Man, just thinking about that Odin sure is making me hungry. Maybe I should have had a snack before I headed out. Saya, what are you doing here? I mean, I, I mean, hi! She must have met the former president. Saya had met him before. You came and waited just for me? I told her beforehand that I had a sudden errand to run. 
楽しみにしてたみたいだったから。Oh, you don't mean. With a little angelic smile, Sarah, Saya picked up the package from the desk. Ta da! You even brought it in the pot! <laughs> you really are something. It must have been so heavy. You stood waiting in front of the school carrying this? You rode the bus with this on your lap? <laughs> in my mind's eye, it was such a surreal sight. It seemed more like she'd lost a dare or something. Arigato g a z i m a s Oh, Saya. The impulse to hug her in gratitude was so strong, I had to struggle to, struggle to keep it under control. After all that work, it would have been a tragedy to spill the Odin. Speaking of, what the heck are you doing here? よおかえりどんわつあみゆもらん。What are you doing slipping in here to eat your noodles? やっぱカレーだよな。お前わかってるよ。The food snatching bandit just stood there, poking at his phone and slurping up his ill gotten curry noodles. I'd been trying my best to ignore him, but the spicy aroma of those noodles ignited my. Appetite. Is the Odin okay? I was actually fearful as I said that. Say, I gave me a thumbs up. We nodded to each other like war buddies who had survived hell together. Seeing that, Takichi slurped his curry noodles in protest. The synergy of sound and smell triggered my stomach like Pavlov's bell.、Uh, and by the way,、uh, those purloined noodles had been my emergency rations. Also, that jerk wasn't even in the astronomy club, he was just a mere basketball bl- club member.、Uh, nowhere special. I brushed him off and started to change out of my uniform to get ready for work. Saya turned her back while I changed. Say, I said, still looking the other way.、Uh, how did she know that? Hi, pretty much. I made some vague agreement trying to misdirect. I didn't want to get into it. And this concerns you how? s a y a s ears turned beet red and she shook her head back and forth. I couldn't see her face, but it was pretty clear she wanted to know who I'd met. It was no big deal. Have you ever heard of the Six Stars Club? <laughs> Saying it over and over, s a y a turned around with a thoughtful look on her face just as I was taking off my pants. She turned bright red again and Whipped back around. I finished changing my pants and hung up my uniform. It was a gathering of all the astronomy clubs in the city, apparently, and they asked me to join it. I gave Saya a rundown of what Orohaimi and Hanukkah told me. It really wasn't something I wanted to talk about, but with that pot full of Odin right in front of me, I couldn't refuse Saya anything. Me neither. Well, it did break up six years ago. After she heard my story, Saya opened her blue and orange eyes wide and stared at me. No way, I'm never looking up again.、Uh, they put my answer on hold, but at the next meeting, I plan to refuse outright. The topic ended on an unpleasant note. Saya's shoulders slumped a little in disappointment. That's why I didn't want to talk about it, I thought to myself. The slurping of Takichi's new curry noodles echoed in the silence. I silently reached out to take the cup from Takichi's hand. He wouldn't let go, though. 
Just give me a little. Gross. Oh, yeah. Takichi picked up some noodles from his with his chopsticks and reached toward me. You. The delectable spicy scent wafted toward my nose. Uh, as if I ripped the cup and chopsticks from Takichi's hands. I scarfed down nearly all the noodles before Takichi could catch them, snatch them back. I smiled, feeling victorious while chomping my mouth full of noodles. That's what you get for being creepy. Takichi picked up the leftover noodles and bits of chopped meat stuck to the cup. He actually looked kind of sad. <laughs> Takichi drank the last of the sauce and smacked his lips. He threw the cup and chopsticks away. <laughs> Takichi stood up and stretched. Just when I thought he was leaving, he stopped. Hmm? What? What what she got to do with anything? Why'd you go and bring her up now? あいつがいなくなってからじゃねえか。もう4年も前だぞ。どっか行っちまったやつのことより今の自分とか身近にいる誰かのこと考えてやってもいいんじゃねえか。Come What's the matter with you bringing up that crap out of nowhere? Uh, we were going to have a falling out at this rate. Uh, just forget it, it's my problem. It's not like he was the one they were talking about. When he saw how upset I was, he gave a little sigh. It's fine. I could see why it bothered him. And I knew he was just trying to help. I had a lot of friends who would try to help me. I, I should be grateful. I said it's fine, and I don't remember you owing me anything. As far as I'm concerned, it's the other way around. The only reason I'm able to do anything is you. If we started counting up who owes who, I'd surely come up even. Uh, we grinned at each other and bumped fists. If anyone had seen, uh, we'd have died from embarrassment. I'm going to hit the toilet. Sai is probably getting worried. Uh, so could you head back for a minute? She probably thought we were beating each other silly or something. She was such a worrywart. Oh. I left Takichi behind and headed for the toilet. When I got back, Takichi was nowhere to be seen. Uh, where's Taki? So that's why he wanted to fill up. Not to mention it looked like he was up to become a starter next year. I hope our basketball club will be alright. What are you talking about? What's so appealing about that? <laughs> no way. If, if you were a boy, that would be a great loss to humanity. A anyway, uh, knowing you, even if you'd been born a boy, you'd just share anything, everything anyway and never fight over it. Saya nodded seriously, uh, with a I hadn't thought of that look on her face. It was kind of funny. 
While she waited for me, Saya had been in the dark looking at the telescope we had set up in the room. I set it up every day to make sure it stayed in good shape. It was a refracting telescope with an 8 centimeter aperture. After the president retired, it hadn't been used once, though. By now, it was already getting dark outside the window. You know, it shouldn't be visible soon. It should be visible soon. Albiero, that is. When I said this, Saya turned to me with a surprised look. No. For some reason, I suddenly got embarrassed and couldn't look at her. Maybe you should stop calling me that. Isn't it embarrassing? The teasing tone in Saya's voice made me feel some even more embarrassed. Well, I'd better get to work. I I'll take you back. I got my bike and came to the gate. I found Saya already there, surrounded by older students going home after practice, all pretending to pray to her. Uh, like she's some kind of graven idol. Do you know her? And yet, Saya had replied so sincerely. She was too funny and too cute. I got on my bike and Saya climbed onto the cargo rack, sitting side saddle. Saya said and peeked at my face to see how I reacted. Yeah, seems that way. She had visited our school so many times that the name had become permanent. It was only natural that someone in another school's uniform would stand out, and with the way Saya looked, it was inevitable. And since she usually showed up with the food, the unfortunate name Commuter Wife just stuck. I'd stayed quiet about it because I thought she didn't like it, but looking at her now, I wasn't so sure. Hold on tight, don't let go. You can never ask Saya to be too careful since she had the condition of a drunk ox. Coordination of a drunk ox. Saya wrapped her arms around my waist and I slowly began to pedal. I quickly passed the other students walking home after their clubs. Saya was light. I barely noticed her sitting in behind, right behind me. As we picked up speed, the wind cooling down as the sunset started to hit us. Maybe without thinking, Saya pressed her body up against my back. It warmed me up. Yep, Odin season. Saya counted off the ingredients on her fingers. Oh man, no more. Just listening to you is making me hungry. Definitely. Stars began to twinkle in the twilight sky. Winter was right upon us. I approached the aging streetlights, their feeble light nearly drowned out by the overwhelming darkness. On that dark country night, only one single building still held back the dark with a dazzling light. The shop and buy, also known as Mikuzuki's Castle that Never Sleeps. Or at least when this place was still on the southeastern border of the Mikuzuki village. Mikuzuki village. Someone once called it that. The Seotome shop, stop and buy, stayed open until 10 p.m. Back then, the village shops usually closed at 6, or at the very latest, 8 at night. It was dark at night, and so when the villagers first gazed upon that stop-and-buy sign glowing in defiance of all the laws of nature, 
they must have shuddered. They said it heralded the coming of civilization to tiny Mazazuki village. People will believe what they will. Since then, Mikuzuki village has been submerged under the new reservoir. Uh, the rest of the village had become part of uh, Hoshinuk city. Even still, people remembered the old name. And that was probably because of the uh, Mikuzuki villagers' pride in their symbol of the civilization. Of course, the convenience stores along the coastal highway are all open 24 hours. I was alone in the shop, uh, sitting on the stool behind the register, poking at my phone. For hard-working students, our late hours could be a real blessing, but for me it was terribly boring. In the late evening, customers only came in sporadically after trains arrived at the station. I went on. It went on for 30 years, apparently. I am not, for reasons. I decided I'm not going to look at the stars anymore. It's just that some stuff happened way back. Unsure of how I should answer, I looked up from my phone. I guess Miss Kamako wasn't even her real name. Uh, she was an office worker living in some big city somewhere. Uh, we met while a while back online. Sometimes when she gets tired of adulting, we can kill time together. I turned my eyes to the single customer in the shop. He still hasn't moved. Old Man Champ had been standing in front of the magazine rack since before I looked down at my phone, and he apparently hadn't moved a muscle. He was still a hunting crane. Ah, uh, Old Man Champ moved. It looks like he's decided on this evening's entertainment. Old Man Champ reached out and took a magazine from the rack, then turned toward the register. And then... A youngish woman came out from the back of the shop. <coughs> hey, Miss Miharu! Complaining under her breath, Miss Mihahu took a pork bun from the warming box under my med the register. Uh, that'll be 180 yen. Mm -hmm. My old teacher stared at my outstretched hand like she had something to say in it. Yes, but my manager told me that under no circumstances was I to feed there, and I quote here, deadbeat daughter for free. Miss Mihaharu reached into her pocket and took out some coins. With an expression of heart-wrenching grief, she placed 180 yen on the counter. It included two five yen coins. Uh, would you like your receipt? <laughs> she sulkily walked over to the shop seating area and, reading a newspaper someone had left, began eating her bought and paid for pork bun. When Miss Mihahu had gone, Old Man Champ snuck out of his hiding place behind a magazine rack and fearfully made his way to the register. Uh, what can I do for you? The old man blushed faintly as he laid down two magazines. The first was a popular young men's comic magazine, Champ Comics. The second was carefully hidden underneath. His evening entertainment turned out to be huge-breasted housewives, apparently. That's 1040 yen out of 1100? 
Using my months of register skill, I quickly scanned the magazines and slipped them smoothly into a paper bag in one motion. That's 60 and then change. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Mm. Old Man Champ, apparently, relieved by my skilled service, left the shop with an air of satisfaction. Sorry, Old Man Champ came by. He's the old guy who always comes in and buys a nudie mag whenever I'm working. He hides it under a Champ Comics each time, so I call him Old Man Champ. <laughs> Old Man Champ chose his raunchy books with all the intensity of a pubescent teenager who just discovered them. But I didn't mean to make fun of him, not at all. His pension allowed him just one magazine. <laughs> That'd make anyone choose carefully indeed. Oh, hey, Miss Miharu. Uh, what happened with that room we talked about? She kept reading the paper as she spoke. I see. Thank you for checking. I gave up, acting like I had known before I asked. I guess I'll try somewhere else. There are places over by the coast. You know, if the manager heard you say that, she'd throw you out for good. When I said this, she put down the newspaper and turned my way. She looked at me with an odd expression on her face. Her tone of voice did sound like she really was worried about me, and I started to regret my teasing. But really, you don't need to. Huh? What was that we were talking about? Um, what? Wait, I... Wait. Just stop right there. Now, where to begin with all this? What was that about my first love? Who told you that? <laughs> It's a mistake. J she's just... Hikari just said that for fun. Miss Miharu just sat there with a smug look on her face. But anyway, if you really thought you were my first love, why'd you work so hard every day to ruin that? <laughs> Nothing. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to run this shop, and I especially don't want to get married. I just want to find a place to live. It was like the one tiny bit of hope I had in my life disappeared in an instant. In its place, I felt a heavy weight fall on my shoulders. As I was breaking out in a cold sweat, I heard Kotoro's voice from outside. Through the glass, he looked at me with pleading eyes. It's a little early, but I guess I'd better take him for his walk. Miss Miharu, can you watch the shop? She answered without enthusiasm, or didn't even 
bother looking up from the paper, but since she did answer, I figured it was okay. I took off my apron and put on my jacket. See you in a bit. <laughs> Watching her from the corner of my eye as the shock of this realization destroyed her concentration and made her throw the paper in anger, I hurried out. Don't get too worked up, okay? You'll wake the neighborhood. Taking Kotaru for his evening walk was also part of my job. I usually did it after closing, but sometimes I'd go earlier if Miss Mikaru was there to take over. Thanks, buddy. You saved me back there. He got me out of a conversation I did not want to get any deeper into. It seemed like there was a conspiracy brewing against me while I wasn't looking. A cold sweat rolled down my back. It honestly made me happy that the manager liked me that much. I was grateful. But jumping all that way to son-in-law was a bit much. I guess I had only my rather fuzzy situation to blame. Oh, what should I do? Then there was the Six Stars Club. All that stuff Takichi talked about was stuck in the back of my mind, too. All these different things got so tied up together that I couldn't make heads or tails of what I should do. I stopped walking and looked up at the sky. There were few stars in the autumn sky, and it seemed so empty. Among them, near the apex of the sky, I saw four bright stars making a quadrilateral. These last few years, it's gotten really bright around here. Even the autumn square looks pale. It was also known as the Great Square of Pegasus. One of the great signs of autumn, these second magnitude stars now appeared as faint as a third or fourth magnitude. And the streetlights grew brighter. The stars were washed from the night sky. They ended up looking darker. The night sky I watched as a little boy was much brighter. The stars, huh? <laughs> When she looked right into my eyes like that, I couldn't speak because I felt like I knew. Those eyes, eager with the light of the heavens that had found its way into our young hearts, pure and clean as the winter sky. My chest grew tight and I couldn't breathe, so I lowered my gaze. I wanted to forget all it all and move on, but I kept retracing those old steps. Standing beneath the starry sky, I suddenly felt afraid and started walking again. <coughs> Kuduru looked ahead and suddenly started barking. A young woman was coming from the other direction. She stared at her cell smartphone and mumbled something. <laughs> the girl raised her head when Kotaru barked. I could see a strained expression on her face in the light of the screen. Uh, she had well-defined lovely features. She looked about my age, but I didn't know her. What could she be doing here at this time of night? <laughs> Hey, quiet down. Sorry about that. Kotaru wagged his tail and started to jump, so I pulled him back and tried to get him to settle down. If this had been a stranger, he would have been afraid and wouldn't have moved. Kotaro? Huh? Just then we could hear the creak and rattle of the rails, signaling a train coming from far off in the distance. Yep. And having said that, she took off running. Like some kind of sports car, she hit top speed immediately and blew past me like the wind. Uh, as she did this, so our eyes met for an instant. Huh? 
but she was off, her ponytails trailing behind her as she raced off to catch the arriving train. I watched her fading shape, dumbstruck, and then looked at Kotaro. She's a friend of yours? Oh. Well, if she used the station often, it was only natural for her to know Kotaro. Looking in the direction she had run, I muttered to myself. She was like a comet. The way she flew through the night, her ponytails trailing behind her like ionized gas and dust, reminded me of a twin-tail comet. I'm back! As soon as I got back to my room, I switched on my electric heater. The weather forecast said tonight would be as cold as the end of December. I set up my cartridge stove and next to that my portable camp stove and turned on the fire. I put Saya's pot of Odin on the cartridge stove and then the camp stove a can of roast chicken. It's really delicious if you open the can and scorch the top a little. I also had three rice balls we were going to throw out at the shop. I was lucky today. They had some salmon filled ones left. And that was my dinner. So hungry. As the chicken juice started to scorch and put out a delicious smell, my stomach started rumbling. But I still had some time before the Odin warmed up. Ooh, better watch out. Watching the steam start to rise, I remembered the telescope I left set up in the corner of my room. The moisture was the great enemy of lenses. I guess I'd better put it away. Even though I'd gone to all the trouble of cleaning it up, it was going back in its case without being used. It'd be nice if next year we got a member who'd actually use you, huh? The reason I was in the astronomy club wasn't because I wanted to look at the stars, I was in it because I could stay in the room. The Astronomy Club had plenty of outdoor goods for all purposes of astronomical observation. It was easy to get permission to stay overnight. Of course, if I'd said I, that was my reason for joining, I'd never gotten permission. I was invited by the president. He told me that if the club didn't get any new members, it was in danger of being closed. When I asked if it was okay to sleep in the club room, he said of course. And as someone with astronomy experience, I was a welcome to addition. And so they started calling me the astronomer who never looks at the stars. I turned off the camp stove with the camp chicken and dug a book out of the pile of my stuff in the corner. Wow, look, a beginner's guide to astronomy. It was an astronomy book for kids, yellowed with age and torn in several places. I opened the book and a letter fell from between the pages. It was held closed with a cute little bunny sticker. I'd gotten it four years earlier. I'd never opened it. I don't need to read it just because of what Taki said. Feeling an unpleasant sweat break out on my forehead, I gathered up my resolve and just then... Huh? It's from Kamako. What's this? Whoa! I is that her cleavage? And there was so much! Kamako's boobs are huge! It was a picture of a woman's cleavage, and though I felt a little guilty, I almost thought of how Urahimi were probably the same size. So this is a grown woman, huh? Such a simple gift, such a bold gift! Or. Was this just what people do in the big city? Still clutching my phone, my hands started to tremble. Just as they had when I was clutching that four-year-old unopened letter. Perhaps even more. Arigato gozaimasu! He really cheered me up. <laughs> I had a feeling I had been trying to decide something very important, but that was all gone. 
I was in such a good mood, and to top it off, the pot of Odin started to bubble. I put the letter back between the pages of Wow, Look, A Beginner's Guide to Astronomy, and returned the book to its place, then sat on my bed as if nothing had happened. Hot, hot, hot. I opened the lid and steam boil billowed out. The room filled with a cloud of steam. Radish, potatoes, fish cakes, cabbage rolls, octopus, and so much more. The ingredients glinted golden and wet with soup through, a, through the steam. The pot was like an overflowing treasure chest. Itadakimas! I offered up my thanks to Saya for bringing it to me and her family for making it and grabbed my chopsticks. Puff puff. Oh, this radish is so good and the potatoes so tender. It was a cold evening. The first touch of winter was set in the air. The hot pot of Odin, the flavor seeping deep into every bite, warmed my body and soul. You've been lying to us the whole time anyway? Our planetary observation journal was in terrible shape. Just like us. From that day on, I could no longer look at the stars. Uchiwa. The president of the Moromisawa Technical Institute's Astronomy Club was dressed in a black uniform coat with a high collar. He spoke with a gentle, apologetic tone that didn't match his expression. As if to put an end to his reluctance, another voice interrupted. The girl with the harsh voice and shaking ponytails was Nisai High's club president. <laughs> Listening to their objections, the pair from Maiku Academy, the club president from Amahai, and I all stared at the papers in our hands. Uh, there was a scent of danger in the air. How did we end up here again? Thirty minutes earlier. Orohaimi looked hopefully at each of us. She was celebrating her the auspicious first meeting of the newly revived Six Stars Club. A quiet round of applause rose. Everyone likely already knew them both, and the response felt rehearsed. As Orohaimi's urging, the girl next to her stood up. She was obviously quite nervous. Amanonoka, also known as Amahai, is a public school on the very southern edge of Hoshinokawa, Hoshinonaka City, in what used to be Amanaka-Naka City. It was on the newly developed seaward side of town, and although it was a public school, it had a metropolitan atmosphere that all the young people in town really found attractive. Even the uniform had a sophisticated, stylish look. Uh, speaking of, uh, according to what Honoka had said a few days earlier, Amahai's astronomy club had only one member, just like ours. Which would, of course, make her the sole member. The president from Amahai sat down with a relieved expression, and the next person stood. 
天の中西千葉区部部長のこの女だっけアルキオネですああそうそうアルキオネのジンの鳴る絵二年だよろしくな Uh, the club president from Amanonaka High, Nisai High School, usually known as Nishai High, gave a casual greeting. The way she looked around at everyone, whipping her ponytails without a trace of timidity, gave everyone the feeling that she was no one to comp not one to compromise. She had used the name Earth Sciences Club, but lots of schools, in lots of schools, astronomy and earth sciences were combined. Actually, in some so called earth science clubs,、uh, they only did astronomy. Although I didn't know if that was the case at Nishai High,、uh, just like Daiichi, it was perfectly normal public school, but from what Hanukkah had said, it once had the most active group of all. Hadn't she said it once had as many as 36 members? Naru's intense confidence might have something to do with that history. After her, a large muscular boy in a long black school coat stood up. Moromisawa Kogyo, Tenmon Bucho, Kerano no Taji de Arimus, Nindis, Dozo Yoros Kyonosus. The club president from the vocational boys' school, Moromisawa Technical, usually called Moromi, had an enthusiastic spirit club style introduction. Moromi was on the north edge of what is now Hoshikono. Hoshino Naka City, in what used to be Hoshino City. It was so far away that I didn't know much about it.、Uh, just judging by first impressions, he didn't really seem like the astronomy type. In fact, his build seemed more suited to playing center on the basketball team. For some reason, he blushed as he spoke. And just as it seemed some conversation was starting off, all eyes turned to me, the only one left. Um. As I stood up and started to introduce myself, I suddenly wanted to make it as short as possible. It's not like I was nervous or anything, it's just that something had started to bother me. Uh, Tayageta. Electra Aliosa. What the hell were they talking about? I'm only a first year, but I'm the, astron I'm the president of Hoshino Daiichi's astronomy club, Akita Sorami. Mamma Mia? Maya, this. Karekosuga. プレアデス七姉妹の長女の名を持つマイヤの空見焼きとよ。Everyone made an ooh sound and there was scattered clapping.、Oh, what was with this weird atmosphere?、Uh, so, um, what exactly does that mean anyway? プレアデス聖団をご存知ないのですか、uh, ?Yeah, I know that much. The Pallades Cluster was a beautiful star cluster that ruled the winter sky, beloved by astronomy fans everywhere. The Japanese name was Subaru. Since it was used by the car manufacturer, lots of people knew that name. The Pallades Cluster had a lot of other names, one of which was the Six Stars. I guess it got that name because when you look with the naked eye, it seems to be made up of six bright stars,、uh, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, they say people with really good eyes can discover a seventh, eighth, or even a nine or even more stars within it. Long ago, when the stars at night were brighter, there was apparently someone who was able to make out more than 20 distinct stars. I 
I had known that the stars in the Pallades cluster all had names, but I didn't know each name, nor where they had come from. And anyway, the term star cluster refers to a massive group of stars all in one place. In the Pallades, the naked eye can only make out six or maybe even seven stars, however, with a telescope you can see tons of stars all crowded together. In reality, it is a cloud of young stars gathered around a point in space about 433 light years away. That cloud is considered to be one of the celestial object and has been given the designation M45, more commonly called the Pleiades Cluster. No, that's not what I meant. I meant, what do those seven sisters have to do with our schools? Orohaimi had this, oh no face, not again look on her face. I didn't think it was really all that natural. I mean, the numbers don't add up for one thing. Uh, where was little Morobi? The president from Nishi High said her voice full of resignation. So this was something the alumni decided, huh? They must have really enjoyed the whole thing. There's no way I'm going to remember all that. It's way too complicated. Why don't we just stop it? All the other members besides Orohaimi seemed to relax at Hanukkah's words. Orohaimi seemed like she actually wanted to use his names all the time. The Sun Girls School was a public all girl high school, and their academic level was the highest in the area. It was an old school predating the Second World War and was known for its really rigid school traditions. It's unlikely that the students would be comfortable mingling unofficially with people from other schools. Orohaimi's announcement seemed to take the cheer out of everyone. Uh, this might be a little difficult to get out of. If I stood up and said I wasn't going to participate now, I wondered what kind of look they would give me. I decided to wait until the meeting finished and quietly let Orohaimi know. The president from Murumisawa raised his hand up. Murahami nodded gracefully. Murahami had a small smile to match her confident expression. Monica handed everyone a sheet of paper. It was a list of the club members at every school and a summary of their equipment. On close study, it looked like the most expensive piece was Maiku Academy's reflecting telescope. The aperture wasn't so great, but apparently it had an equatorial mount. Apart from that, Nishihai had a digital single lens reflex camera with a wide angle lens for night sky photography that looked pretty expensive. Uh, Murumisawa was like our school, they only had beginner stuff, and then we came to Amahai, who didn't even have a telescope. I wondered if, I'd been, if it had been thrown away or put in some storage building or if maybe someone had just taken it. Our club probably had a similar problem. Orohaimi 
Orohime's proposal caused a bit of commotion. So no boy and kill a Shinsei Mutsrabos no Kibo Tonari Kisoko no Shocho Tonari de Show. いいかもしれないねっていうかそのくらいのメリットがないと一緒にやる意味がないよそうかもしれませんねうち望遠鏡を持ってないんでそうしていただけるととてもありがたいです Well, all the other school reps were busy reacting I had a question about how much money are we talking Despite having no intention of joining I went and asked a silly question 費用の内訳と Everyone turned the page and then recoiled in horror. What I understood why everyone was so shocked. The prices written there weren't quite beyond everyone just chipping in a bit. So you mondaja nide so core So this name It looked like Orohime January didn't see what the problem was. Uh, the price they'd written was almost equal to a full month's part time wages. Uh, for clubs like ours that were having issues with membership numbers, our budgets would never even come close to covering an expense like that. Of course, to buy a really good telescope, it would really cost about that much. より高度な活動を行っていくためですのよ。そのための出費ならば仕方がありませんわ。後々後輩たちに受け継がれることを考えても中途半端なもので済ませるわけにはまいりません。うちは高価な望遠鏡より一人一つの双眼鏡を元に
She put it kind of harshly, but I felt like Nauru had a point. Uh, which should have made it kind of weird that I hadn't left when she did. Except that I felt this weird kind of power coming from Orahime. I guess you could say she made me feel hopeful. We'd only met twice, so I couldn't really say I knew her well enough, but I couldn't deny her when she said she didn't know about the real world. Orahime repeated the phrase as if she had just remembered something. They had planned an observation meet, a chance to look at the skies, and to just hang out this, for this evening. Hanukkah nodded, like she'd known before she asked. Noruko from Amahai looked disappointed when she saw that. She opened her mouth as if to say something, but nothing came out. Amahai's astronomy club had only one member, just like Daiichi's. I bet she'd really been looking forward to uh, tonight's meetup. No, we should still do it. I said, interrupting Hanukkah. Everyone looked at me surprised. I mean, we are already gathered together like this, and well, the stars are only visible tonight, right? Orahime wiped the tears from the corners of her eyes. <laughs> Orahime had regained her enthusiasm and the whole group began stargazing preparations. Uh, forcing a smile on my face, I thought to myself, Oh boy, now you've done it. Now it would be even harder to quit. She said all this haltingly, likely thinking back on all those lonely days of solitary club activities, but a smile rose on her lips. <laughs> だから、Orahime listened to their conversation with a complicated expression on her face, then turned to me and nodded. Hmm? Um, no, I didn't do anything. I felt a bitter smile rise. I'd only come just to tell them I wasn't joining, and just when I thought I should have said so, I ended up encouraging the meetup. I was shocked at my own contradictory behavior. Oh, come on now, that's not true. You don't need to take all this on yourself, Arahami. If she had called out to us, this meeting would never have happened. I had to admire that kind of enthusiasm that could persuade people from all these different schools to come and meet after years of silence. And now here I am, apparently getting ready to join them in stargazing. <clears throat> Me, the astronomer who never looks at the stars. Anyway, I'd have already taken the night off work. I had no idea where they were planning on to go stargazing, but as the only guy, 
I took on the responsibilities like carrying heavy things and watching over the girls. Noriko checked on her smartphone, then pushed the bus stop signal. The next stop? The bus stop in front of Makazuki Station. Meaning, of course, right in front of the stop and by. Kotaru noticed me immediately as I got off the bus and raised his head, ears twitching. But more and more strangers got off the bus. He squirmed into his doghouse and hid. Are we taking the train from here? With her phone in one hand, Noriko took the lead. I wondered why she was guiding. I didn't really understand, but since Urahaimi seemed happy to follow her lead, I went along after. Are you sure this is the right way? This way? With Noroku out in front, we walked down a country road past a few scattered houses, and soon a large bridge-like structure appeared. It was an enormous concrete wall holding back the river, the, the river, the dam. She said, checking her smartphone map. We crossed over the walkway on top of the dam. Orahami said in an astonished tone. For a dam, it probably wasn't that big, but when seen up from up close like this, it really felt like something. Oh, no, not really. Just brings back some old memories. Uh, there used to be a bridge over there. I said while pointing to a spot downriver. Yeah. She seemed to be waiting for more about the bridge. I, I didn't want to explain any further, and she just looked at me, puzzled. Pretending not to notice her gaze, I looked out over the lake formed by the dam. Orange stars were reflected off the deep blue wa surface of the water. I didn't want to admit it, but it was beautiful. It was a beautiful sight. Uh, part of our village was under that lake. Uh, Mikazuki Village, the village where we had spent our childhood. I guess it's only a home for fish now. On the other side of the dam, the road started to climb the mountainside. We continued a while down the road, broken asphalt before Noriko spoke again. <laughs> we turned away from the old road and started down a trackless path. Uh, though they'd been happily following thus far, Hanukkah and Orohaimi's faces started to look uneasy when... Noriko had led us to a wide open space on the side of the small mountain. Uh, there were no large trees here, and the world spread out before us. Orohaimi looked around, her eyes sparkling with excitement, even though she should have been exhausted from the walk up. Her big job completed successfully, Noriko breathed a sigh of relief. Unbelievable, this is the place. I muttered a knowingly a wry smile on my face. I'd been here before. It was located just outside of Mizuku, uh, Amikazuku Village. Uh, we used to come here all the time to see the stars. It was hard to get it, to get to, but I was certain there was no better place in all of, all of Hoshinonaka City to observe the night sky. And it had hardly changed in all, at all in four years. It was full of memories, but for me, who had given up stargazing, it was also painful. So, everyone, at Orohami's urging, everyone set down their luggage and got ready for the stargazing meetup.
コタちゃんお手おおかわりおおおかわりだよコタちゃんそれは伏せだよおかわりはねうんお腹見せるんじゃなくて相変わらず半端にしか芸を覚えない犬だね賢いのかアホなのかあ,あ先生こんばんははいよこんばんはあいつ天文部の集まりに行ってるんだっておかげで店番やらされて残々だわよ探訪会やるって話だけど何あいつまた星を見る気になったのそうじゃないみたいです断るつもりだって言ってたからなんだそうなのであんたは何してるの私はコタちゃんと遊ぼうと思ってなるほどあいつは結局どうしたのか気になって家にいても落ち着かないからここで待ってると赤くなっちゃってなゲイ投げじゃないのいいね若いってのは先生だってまだまだ若いですよ自信持ってくださいちょっとこっち来なさいんこめかみグリグリの系だトゥストゥストゥストゥなんでですかそんな気遣いいらんのじゃトゥストゥストゥストゥわかいあんたにはまだわかんないでしょうけどアラサーには触れてはならないデリケートゾーンがあるのよ特にニートのアラサーには注意なさい見た目はこんなやさぐれててもその内面は年頃の娘のようにナイーブだからわかりましたグリグリして悪かったわねなでなでしてあげるわほんとこんなかわいい子に心配かけて悪い男ねあいつはあきとくんってまだ星を見てるんですえそうなのでもあいつ星を見ない天文部員とか言われてるんじゃ時々どうしても見たくなった時は一人で山に登ってるんですあれってそうだったんだま星は見ないとか言いながら天文部にいるようなやつだしねでもあんまり楽しそうじゃないみたいです山に行った次の日にも星の話してくれたことないしハキトくんすぐ顔に出るからなんとなくわかるんですふんそれであん私ですかここでそうやってけなげしてるのは何のため私はあっくんにまた星を見てほしい昔みたいにあのアルビリオの時みたいにでも私じゃダメだから。そんなことないと思うけどさやみたいな可愛い子にお願いされたらあの年頃の男子なら何だっていうこと聞いてくれるんじゃないの全国大会連れてってくれたらキスしてあげるみたいにさほら言ってみ言ってみうん全国大会連れてってくれたらキスしてあげるおお。妬ましいくらい初々しくて可愛らしいわねうう恥ずかしいよま今夜の官房会が
また星を見るきっかけにでもなればいいんだけどねはいまた time we got in Maiku Academy's astronomical telescope all set up the world around us had fallen into complete darkness 今夜はあいにくの満月看望には向かない夜ですわねどうして満月じゃダメなんですか Uh, the moon is really quite bright. On a clear night, you can read by the light of the full moon.、Uh, that bright light washes out the fainter light of the stars. So, If we continued working together in the Six Stars Club, we'd eventually have a perfect night for our observation, too. Uh, but there were only three schools left, and if I dropped out, there would leave only two.、Uh, that might make things a bit difficult. We all looked up pondering the sky. The autumn sky is considered the most boring of the four seasons, with few particularly bright bodies. There's the Andromeda Galaxy. I blurted it out when the thought came to me, and Orohaimi turned to me. Hanukkah adjusted the telescope with practiced movements. It was a Newtonian reflecting telescope. It had an equatorial mount, and after polar alignment, you could find any celestial body you wanted by entering the coordinates. For a school club, it was quite extravagant. Noriko said, looking straight up into the sky. We were searching for a galaxy different from ours out there in the dark. But without knowing where to look, no one would ever find it.、Uh, do you know how to find the Great Square? Yes, I know that it's one of the two of the Andromeda. Do you see a kind of fuzzy body around Andromeda's knee? Uh, this object, that unlike the other stars around it, looks like a fuzzy patch of light, is the Andromeda Galaxy. It's the nearest galaxy to our own, the Milky Way. Yeah, I think the full moon's a bit too bright. Hanukkah stepped aside and Noriko looked through the telescope. Noriko's voice sounded a little disappointed. Orohaimi hated to hear words like bland or ordinary, so you'd expect her to be disappointed, but she smiled instead. Noriko blinked at this extraordinary number suddenly thrown at her. That object is 2.3 million light years away, right? Orohaimi nodded, smiling wildly. Noriko 
ご自分の目で<笑>すごいスケールですねアリコは思い出を見てみてアピクチャーシューズは、シェイプの絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の絵の Then, so he was me. She said coaxingly, looking up at me with puppy dog eyes. Who knew that older, beautiful girls could command such powerful weapons of persuasion?、Uh, okay, m- maybe just a little. Unable to resist, I bent over to look through the lowered eyepiece. After a quiet, deep breath, I looked through the telescope into the realm of the stars. Light filled my vision. Even at this low magnification, the massive galaxy covered the telescope's field of vision. It spread out at an angle, a patch of hazy light, unrecognizable as the clear spiral you see in pictures. But I knew it. I knew that patch of light came from the stars floating on the other side of the near endless void. I knew that 2.3 million light year old light was the truth. Of a galaxy crowded with over 400 billion stars, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. I was looking at the light of countless stars in a place that our current civilization could never even reach. I was overcome with the sense that I was standing on this clump of rock we call Earth as it floated through the void. I felt like I was about to leave the Earth to embark on a distant journey to the realm of the stars themselves. And yet, in the next instant, I was visited with a deeply unpleasant sensation, and my elation evaporated, leaving my heart cold. I was suddenly full of loneliness, anxiety, and irritation, as if I had been cast off alone into the dark sky. It was hard to breathe. I jumped away from the telescope as if I'd wakened from a nightmare. Hi.、No? When I left the telescope, Orahime sat up, eager to take her turn. Then, after Hanukkah's turn, the three girls excitedly talked about what they saw. They looked so happy it was easy to see how much they loved the stars. Those smiling faces glowed just as brightly as the Andromeda galaxy in the telescope had. I'm going to have a look over here. I didn't know if they heard or not, but I went away. I went anyway. The forest grew thick a bit further uphill from where everyone was talking. I wandered around up here.、Uh, no matter how bright the full moon, it was still dark in the woods. I walked down the path, lighting my, the way with my phone. I felt so lonely. I always felt this way when I looked at the stars. Whenever I glimpsed at the distant, twinkling world of the stars, I yearned for them. And yet, no matter how deeply I hoped, I knew I could never reach them. No matter how far I stretched out my hand, I could never touch them. I would feel abandoned in the endless dark, and breathing would come di- become difficult. It's just too much for my eyes accustomed to the dark. It had been so long since I'd seen stars through a telescope. They had been so bright, they burned my eyes. Even after I'd left, that brightness remained in the back of my eyes. And so I wandered in that dark place where I couldn't see the stars. After walking mindlessly for a while, I suddenly saw the night sky beyond the trees. If I walked any further, I'd come to the edge of the woods, and there would be. It was so dark I couldn't quite make it out. The silhouette of a large rectangular shape floated in the darkness, reflecting a bit of the moonlight. It's still here. Did I somehow go back in time as I wandered these woods? Or could it be that this was a special space somehow outside the normal flow of time? The train car was still here. I climbed up on the platform and stared at the train. Stopped there, unchanged after all these years. 
I couldn't see if it had changed at all in the dark. Uh, the windows were pitch black as well. The platform was overgrown with weeds, and withered ivy twisted over it, uh, but it didn't seem to have changed at all from four years ago. What an odd, with an odd feeling, as if I were in a dream, I walked around the train car. And? I found someone. Someone was standing on the roof of the train. A girl? The area around us was covered in darkness. And yet, that shape seemed to glow, giving off a faint white light that didn't let the darkness near. Bathed in the moonlight, she stood there, like a prima donna on stage. The Goddess of the Moon. This uncharacteristic thought rose in my mind, likely because of an earlier conversation. But the real reason for that feeling could have been the way she was standing, her hands raised to the sky. She was reaching out as if she could touch the stars. I feel like I've seen her somewhere. That's right, it was the girl I ran into at the station when I was walking Katuru a while back. I remembered her ponytails trailing out like the trails of a comet. And yet that knowledge didn't shake the goddess-like feeling about her. Honestly, meeting her here like this only strengthened the mystique. Well, huh? The sudden melody coming from my pocket almost gave me a heart attack. It seemed to give the girl standing on the train one, too. She whipped around to look at me in surprise. Uh, um, I, I'm not a creep. I pulled out my phone and answered without checking the name on the caller. Hello? Oh, sorry, I just thought I'd take a walk around. Uh, right, I'll be right there. I hung up the phone and looked up to find the girl still staring at me. Uh, but while she had looked confused at first, now she was staring as if trying to figure something out. Akito. Huh? Akito. Da yo ne. How does she know my name? And that voice? Hickory? I called out, half convinced, half unbelieving. <laughs> I was completely confused as she stared down at me with an elated expression and gave me a peace sign. The full moon still bathed her face and her figure in pale light. It was mystical, like some flawless CGI out of a movie. Like I was in some bizarre dream. Like it was anything but real. It can't be. I was completely unable to grasp what was happening. But that voice was unmistakably real. It was Hickory's voice, and one I knew so well. All right, we're going to stop here for the end of video one. I thank you for playing along with me. Um, we've just gotten through really what was the introduction of the common route, and um, we'll continue on from here.